you very much for such an insightful presentation. It's a pleasure for our group to discuss an impactful work by Dr. Cecilia Rica on the rise of digital monopolies uh, within the digital uh, intellectual monopolies within the digital sector. And in our agenda, first we will start with summary of papers and uh, we would love to discover areas of future research that we can cover today. Uh, then we will talk about institutional shortcoming, antitrust issues, uh, and then following this we will uh, share environmental implications um, about considering uh, ecological um, footprint uh, related to AI technology. Uh, and um, the first paper uh, dives deep into the evolution from traditional asset-based uh, monopolies uh, to what is called uh, digital intellectual monopolies. And unlike the monopolies uh, of the industrial age, which were centered around tangible assets, um, they take giants wield power through, the, through their vast repositories of data and uh, uh, gatekeeping roles in the digital information ecosystem. Uh, this transformation didn't occur in a vacuum. In fact, it was facilitated by many, by significant changes in legal and uh, institutional frameworks. Uh, for example, as it was already discussed today, TRIPS has played a big role in standardizing IP laws globally, uh, often, but often skewed towards interests of big tech uh, companies, of uh, big, of tech-rich nations. Uh, furthermore, the legal support for digital rights management and uh, strategic lobbying have been instrumental for these companies. Uh, next is innovation and competition, and while these giants drive significant technological advancement, uh, their market dominance can also stifle competition and limit the scope for new entrants, potentially leading to less diversity in innovation uh, and uh, concentration of market power. Uh, Next slide, thank you. Uh, in the second paper, Dr. Recap analyzes the AI strategies of um, major US tech companies, revealing diverse approaches to knowledge management and innovation from, for example, Microsoft frenemies uh, to Amazon's uh, focus on secrecy, showing how each company uniquely develops AI and manage their intellectual property. And a commendable aspect of paper uh, of the paper is comprehensive methodology by analyzing patterns, publications, conference papers. The author provides a um, detailed view on intellectual landscape. And we would also, and also she uses a mixed approach combining biometric analysis with qualitative interviews with big tech employees. Uh, and also an innovative use of AI talent as a metric. But while this work is foundational in terms of historical legal context, we were left with the need to further explore current and recent legislative and uh, policy developments concerning tech com big tech companies. Uh, for example, the GDPR. GDPR has significantly changed how data is handled and protected in Europe uh, related to uh, big tech companies. Also, U.S. antitrust laws, uh, there are ongoing debates and legal actions uh, in the U.S. Um, concerning antitrust laws and especially those uh, such companies as Google and Facebook. Uh, and also, for example, there are, there are calls for breaking up these companies. Um, the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act in the EU, this act aimed to address digital power imbalance uh, and could reshape how, tech, how big tech companies operate within the EU market, especially concerning uh, market competition and content regulation. And um, geographical taxing of companies, there are recent discussions and legal actions toward um, taxing these companies based on their geographical operations rather than uh, where they are headquartered, which can potentially uh, impact their revenue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, papers, papers also discuss in intra-industry relations, but we would also like to delve deeper into the societal implications and, for example, consumer data control and privacy. 
in especially in terms of consumer privacy and autonomy, which closely aligns with Zuboff's uh, concept of surveillance capitalism uh, concerning individual privacy and social norms. Uh, influence on public discourse. Um, these companies not only control vast data, but also the platforms uh, where this public discourse unfolds. And um, these companies' decisions on content regulation, on algorithmic prioritization, on data sharing can impact um, democratic, democratical processes and the freedom of expression. And lastly, labor market and employment practices, the power dynamics or, uh, in big tech, big tech companies extend beyond traditional employer-employee relationships, uh, often broadly influencing labor markets, labor market trends and uh, policies. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, deeper, and uh, we would also like to discuss global, global power dynamics and especially the um, role of periphery, periphery countries in this global innovation system, which is dominated by big tech companies from developed nations. And we will maybe raise this question during Q&A part. And now I pass the floor to Tisha, who will talk about institutional Okay, um, so to complement the presentation, we now discuss on how institutions lack in addressing regulatory issues that uh, allowed big data to accumulate power to become capitalism as usual. So um, as we established that uh, digital era made it more complicated to define markets. So as uh, Professor mentioned, she said digital uh, big data companies are permeating different sectors. So in anti antitrust parlance, we, we have this thing called single markets versus multi-sided markets. So we're used to dealing with um, normal um, traditional companies that have a seller, and you go to the supermarket and that directly goes to the consumer. And we have here what we call vertical integration where uh, the supply chain is controlled. But what happens in uh, platforms is that there are two groups of um, actors that uh, they need each other, but they cannot capture the mutual value. So the, the role of the platform is to facilitate these direct interactions. For example, Facebook, as has been mentioned, uh, for us, it's like a free service, but there is an intangible exchange of data. That's really is the price, which we'll talk about later. And on the other hand, they also serve advertis um, companies with advertisement slots, and that's how we interact directly with them. But what is the implication on the institutional side? So I'll give a little story when I was uh, working in the Philippine Competition Commission. So because we are a quasi-judicial body, um, occasionally we do raids and undercover missions. So for example, when I was assigned in an FMCG case, that uh, one juice company is, uh, 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 how do you say, um, alleged, alleged to be uh, com covering a lot of shelf space. So we went undercover in like Philippine grocery stores and we counted the shelf space and uh, we went to different malls to see whether they really are having this anti-competitive agreement with the supermarket. So that's what's happening in tangible markets. But can you imagine in intangible markets how our economy is supposed to establish this? Can we still do raids in antitrust companies? Even though we have the legal um, capacity to do it, should economists be hackers also? Like, that's my personal question. <laughs> Next slide. So just to um, show what's happening, so there's clearly a uh, lapse in the institutional uh, assistance. So, and um, because of the highly technical nature of big data, one way that this is addressed is through citizen mobilization. So we give this case study, for example, in 2022, a group of software engineers organized themselves and launched what they call the Open Web Advocacy. And they launched a paper called Bridging Competition to Walled Gardens. So why did they do this? This is because all iOS browsers currently, even though they allow you to download other browsers, they have the same uh, rendering engine, which is called WebKit. So again, this is that's what they say, like, whatever you have, it's just a branded skin of Safari. 
So um, they worked with the UK Competition and Markets Authority and the UK uh, institution supported the, their claim that it's anti-competitive. So after a year, um, now Apple is expected to remove this iOS requirement and the kind of the software developers won. So in iOS 17, they're, they're expected to welcome the competition of Google and Mozilla that allows them to use Blink and Gecko respectively. Next slide. So, but what are the root causes of these shortcomings? So, we argue that it's basically uh, of the traditional economic theories behind competition economics. So first, the antitrust uh, companies, they are focusing on a price-centric approach. So it neglects the non-price parameters or non-economic injuries such as data privacy considerations. So this allows the accumulation of the self-reinforcing market power that we talked about. In short, data becomes the barrier to entry. So now the question for regulators is that, should we consider data when it's owned by one company as a monopoly? And if so, uh, then scholars argue that this ability of data monopolists to block others from competition should not be tr treated differently than an oil company or a railroad company that stifles innovation. Second is dynamic efficiency. Short-term effects of mergers and acquisitions are true. It's true that it's price-related, but the most harmful effects are of dynamic nature, which is when business innovates or add new products. But because this is harder to measure, authorities simply neglect this part of the investigation and they simply do not or they simply do not have the tools to do so. The, the third challenge lies in the conventional be belief that similar products compete more intensely. So this is rooted from the EU Commission's notion of relevant product market. And um, this is also relevant in countries um, Outside Europe, for example, our, cons our, our competition law is largely based on US and EU. So we follow this definition. So when we do investigations, we need to first define what is the relevant product, product market. And because theory says that the relevant product market should be just the similar products, what happens in data-driven driven monopolies? What happens, for example, is that in the Facebook and WhatsApp case, the commission's argument is that they are too dissimilar. So they overlook the, the app's complementarity. So it neglects the, the motives of Facebook to eliminate what we call a maverick firm. So in, an, in antitrust and competition law, this is called a killer acquisition, where you kill by acquiring a baby, a, a nascent firm, so to say, before they can be a threat to your market share. Next slide. So what can we do about it? Uh, first, a policy mandate that's uh, suggested is data sharing because maybe fines are not enough. Financial penalties are not enough because they impact profitability, but they do not address the data monopoly that's uh, driving behind this self-forcing uh, market power. Next is merger uh, rest retrospective analysis. The debate concentrates on uh, financial penalties. Is that enough or should we consider undoing the mergers themselves? And lastly is greater coordination for competition, consumer protection, and privacy agencies. So this will enhance the understanding of privacy degradation issues. So it's not only one institution that's working on a severely complex and um, uh, large issue because uh, big data is evolving very quickly and it's more than consumer welfare. And I'll, I'll pass the floor to Alexi. Thank you. <clears throat> So while we know it was not the focus of the articles and your presentation, we still wanted to bring environmental implications to the discussion. So this is the focus on this part. And well, as we saw, digital um, monopolies encompassing companies, giants like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, or Facebook have a substantial mm. environmental footprint. So from data center, data center operations, cloud services, and rapid technological obsolescence, well, this leads to increased resource extraction and electronic waste. And what one solution to tackle this 
would be the extraction of valuable resources directly from e-waste, such as precious metals, but the research is still ongoing and current technologies face significant limitations. And the EU's uh, regulatory framework is still uh, facing challenging challenges Sorry, in trying to reconcile the dual identity of e-waste as both a socio-ecological risk and an economic resource. And while well, AI models in themselves are significant emitters of carbon, so research from Strawberry Al in 2019 reports that training a single large language model emits around 300,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which equivalents to 125 round trip flights between New York and Beijing. And well, to better understand the externalities associated with this energy consumption and e-waste, we could turn to concepts such as full cost accounting from ecological economics, but the main idea here is to try and compass the full life cycle of the product from production to disposal. And so Kate Crawford and Vladen Jollers, award-winning sorry, visual map and essay titled Anatomy of an AI System, uh, does just that, using Amazon's Echo as an example. And at every level they wrote, contemporary technology is deeply rooted in the exploitation of human bodies, starting from extracting metals from the earth and the resulting environmental effects to the sweatshops of programmers that keep the system going to, as we saw also, the personal data about the user that the device gathers. And so here you have the whole map, but we, if we focus, for example, on uh, the part on assemblers, Sorry, and this relates to uh, you mentioning uh, the super exploiting of workers. So, for example, um, we have all the hazards the workers face, and well, it's very tiny, but <laughs> explosions, exposure to dust and toxic substances, inconsistent health and safety policies, and major depression and risk of suicide. Well, and the list goes on. And, sorry. <laughs> But, well, overall, public awareness and environmental activism play an instrumental role in holding big tech companies accountable. So research from DAR in 2020 reports from activism of tech workers in 2019 urging their employers, including Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter, to recognize their role in the climate crisis. However, um, despite commitments to using more renewable energy, well, and drawing from Greenpeace Clicking Clean report from 2017, they report that there has been very limited progress and that um, also taking the example of Amazon, who exhibited even increased emissions despite pledges for net zero emissions by 2040. Sorry. <laughs> and moreover, they report that Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, and many others actually market the AI solutions to companies that work and support fossil fuel extractions such as Shell. And another focus um, can be the emphasis on the necessi necessity of gaining regional control over data centers to counter the global dominance of a few core players, as we understood. And according to the author, this could go through increased legislation, but also, as Alexandra Luciani proposes, through tax incentives for cloud providers to open data centers in regions we re with renewable energy sources, such as hydro or solar energy. And finally, DAO reports advocacy for the implementation of environmental standards, green AI certifications, practical industry frameworks, and guidelines to support the production of AI technologies aligned with sustainable principles. So um, here we gathered our questions, so I'll leave the floor. <laughs> Yeah, now we have a few questions related to what we discussed today. So the first is big data monopoly is usually concentrated in global north, but are there implications for emerging countries? Are there foreseen challenges by users or institutional regulators because of this accumulation of market power? Like in other words also, uh, is there even a need to develop technologies for these uh, con countries? Um, second question, uh, what role do you see big tech companies playing in addressing environmental challenges? Are big, com are big tech companies either driving green technology innovation or conversely hindering innovation by reinforcing highly polluting technologies? And finally, what are the implications of non-economic effects of big data monopoly, for example, in social injustice? 
It's the end. So, going very fast so that I can, I will try to answer in. I will try to answer in less than five minutes, and thanks a lot, and I will stand up as well. So um, the first thing is that these are not big data monopolies. These, um, and this is important to highlight it, because uh, data is only one part. Actually, companies like Uber also harvest data. It's not just a matter of harvesting data. It's a matter of controlling the production of knowledge, including data. So in the case of AI, what distinguishes companies like Google, Amazon, and Microsoft from the rest is that they control the whole technology package. And data is really only one part of the story, which is also why just trying to regulate data will never work. Actually, if you, let's say, we regulate data in a way that it's uh, opening all the data that exists, we will further favor those with the larger subsortive capacity that are prepared to process that data with the most advanced algorithms and store the, the results of training those models and so on and so forth. So, this is very important to highlight also in terms of like the larger part of the discussions and how policies can address or not these things. Then um, another thing is that um, I honestly don't remember what I gave you to read. But let's say I gave you the new left review piece that is uh, that starts with a question, capitalism as usual. The answer to that question is no, this is not capitalism as usual. And I'm asking that question because I'm not I, I don't think that calling this era techno-feudalism is a um, good way to characterize it. It's a still capitalism, there is still capitalist relationships. I think that uh, it's a too global north approach to think that it's techno-feudalism because the highlight of the relevance of rents in the global north is true that it's to some degree a newer phenomenon, but it's part of how capital accumulation takes place place regularly in the global south among other things so um so it's not capitalism as usual what is different is a bit of what i was presenting and again i want to be very very fast yes we need hackers certainly i mean maybe not us as economists but we need a lot of hackers of course we do and then um i think about the question of uh, i address a bit of the way i see the, the role of these, like the peripheries in this discussion in the presentation. So to make it shorter, I, I will just go to the second question and say that intellectual monopolies, in particular big tech companies, are trying to develop a business out of the energy transition. So the bad guys are the oil companies and they are trying to position themselves as the good guys. The good guys that are developing the crucial intangibles, not only developing, but capturing broadly the intangibles that are being uh, produced to address the energy transition. Basically, in one word, and this here, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Silvia Wego, who's finishing her PhD at, um, at a German university, and I was um, co-supervising her. What she was looking at is how Amazon was developing a lot of energy uh, services on the cloud, like energy systems services on the cloud, basically to handle more efficiently the provision of energy when you don't have a constant flow of energy coming because you're not using non-renewable sources, but you are using renewable ones and you cannot, and using data with AI to predict, one, the different sources that you will have, how much, and demand becomes even more important. So AI-related and data-related intangibles become even more important, and these companies are on top, like, pretending that all the energy consumption they are doing doesn't exist. They are trying to sell themselves as companies that are contributing to the energy, trans energy transition. But basically, what I was describing about how they enter other sectors and markets, this is how they are entering the energy sector at the same time. And um, I wanted to say something else. Ah, yes, I wanted to give you one data point, which is that one of my Google interviewees told me that a search on BART, on Google's large language model, consumes 15 times more energy that, than searching on the regular Google search. So just to give you a sense of this double discourse. And then one thing that I didn't do much was comment on policies. And I think that part of what you were doing was about that and the policy implications. Uh, let me just say one word about GDPR, the Digital Markets Act, and so on. 
they are not looking at the source of the market concentration, never looking at that. They do not identify that these companies are intellectual monopolies. And if you just focus on trying to prove that they are market monopolies, this is very complicated. First of all, because they are not. I mean, they can say that if the market of attention, I, I, in my market of attention, I should even include my mom, who texts me every two days, like, hi, how are you? Is it everything okay? So she's also competing for my attention, as much as a Netflix show or a Facebook post or whatever. So really, it's very complicated to determine the relevant market. And, and even, let's say, we moved beyond all that, it was determined, and so on and so forth. Yes, these companies were fined. Do you know how much money they pay, paid from all the fines they received? Zero. Apple never paid for uh, the use of privileged taxes in Ireland, and this is still going, it has been going for, I lost track of time, maybe 10 years now. Google never paid for the Google shopping and all the other things that uh, the EU was accusing Google and of. So the fines not only come very late, and exactly as you were saying correctly, they do not dismantle these power structures, but also we need to think of alternative solutions that go beyond the idea of breaking them up First of all, because part of the technologies they have encapsulated lead to, market, to natural monopolies. Having one search engine is more efficient because of how the technology works. We may like it more or less. We may think that efficiency is something we don't need. But basically, if we all search on the same place, the algorithm will get better and better. And therefore, our, the results of our searches will be more accurate in principle. Does this mean that we need to leave Google? profiting from that and feeding us with targeted ads or whatever ad they want to feed us. No, certainly not. That is because it's a natural monopoly, we have grounds to say that this should be public. This should be a commons and, it, and, and for me, we need to more think about the structures of data commoning, data sharing, recognizing that, okay, it can be my data, but I decide that I want to share it for certain purposes. For instance, for identifying earlier potential pandemics, causes of diseases, and so on and so forth. We, and I should also be able to decide who I'm sharing this data with. If in the end the technology should be there to help us address the worst challenges of our time, we cannot expect companies, no matter if they are big or small, to put solving global challenges up front of making profits. It's, they are not charities. So they will not simply not do it. So I think that in the end, all this, my discussion about planning and so on, one thing that I didn't have time to emphasize on, claims for a more active role of the states as planners, not as a market, just not only addressing the market failures or creating markets or developing, or, or developing public-private partnerships and these type of things that are like super popular these days, not only uh, developing industrial policies to have what your own intellectual monopolies and then have more inequality inside your country and not addressing pr properly the ecological challenges. For me, everything points if these are the largest companies in the world and they use the knowledge that they appropriate to plan portions of the world beyond the assets they own, everything points to a larger role of planning democratically, de decentralized, highlighting the role of, of different. Uh, localities and regions, but we can do all that with the technology. It's a political decision and it's a, yeah, a, a political agency what is needed. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering... Um, was, oh, yeah. um, hi, my name is Max, I'm from Germany. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, like on the on the macro level effects of uh, intellectual property rights, because like um, in our courses we learn a lot about secular stagnation and how that relates to the income distribution, right? Like uh, ever more higher incomes, having a lower propensity co to consume, uh, slowing the growth rate. But now I'm I'm wondering like uh, with this um, presentation like. Uh, where if like the industrial structure changes from like these Fordist companies with high fixed capital assets to uh, at a high reinvestment rate to a more IPR based kind of regime of accumulation with uh, I mean you talked about big laboratories and so on but I guess that their like fixed capital formation rate is much lower than that of I don't know General Motors or um, so on and. Is that also can like have there been studies to quantify the impact of like the change in industrial structure in secular stagnation, or is that only taken to be a phenomenon of the income distribution? 
Maybe we can gather a few questions just because I tend to speak too much. So this will give you more space to speak. And I will just write down in the meantime a bit of the question. So mm -hmm. whenever you get the mic, feel free to ask. Hi, I'm Fazli from Uzbekistan, and thank you for the presentation. Um, considering all the issues that we discussed on uh, monopolization of uh, knowledge and information, do we, how plausible do you think it is to use um, knowledge commons governance system as a as a solution to the uh, to, to those all those issues? Hello, I'm Gabriela from El Salvador. Um, is technological cooperation happening among big techs? It is a common strategy, or is more about big techs, like in a way, cooperating with the smaller companies to create their knowledge? Is there any other question? Yes. And here also, yeah. Um, I found your comment interesting about the stickiness about of the software development. I was just wondering, what does the stickiness look like? What, yeah, how do they do it? Because you were talking about Amazon. Thank you. Um, Giovanna here wants to ask a question, <laughs> but um, I was just wondering. Sorry, oh. my comment. <laughs> No, I was thinking about the, the role of the state like, because it's a um, power competition, so where are they? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Owen from the UK. Uh, you mentioned um, how Amazon has kind of checked out of the AI, um, the AI sort of processing race, and you mentioned that there were some specific reasons for that. No, what, what I mentioned was that they were not so active in publishing papers. Oh, okay, okay. But I can comment also on the differences between them. Yeah, yeah that would be nice. Thank you. Okay. I will start addressing some, and for others, I will just show you very briefly some uh, of the slides that I didn't have time to show. And also, I'm running out of battery, so I, let's try to plug it a bit while I'll answer. Mm, and what is it that I have plugged here? Oh, okay, here, this. Okay, so macro implications. So uh, let me first say that I'm a, not a macroeconomist, so I will not be able to cover everything. And this is one of the things that we want to address with this twin uh, extractivism paper, a bit of those dynamics. What I know from the work of other people and from reading the work of other people is that one of the things that happen at the macro level is that um, the U.S. state, and, and this I'm quoting Hermann Schwartz, who has uh, a very interesting papers. I recommend his work a lot. I couldn't recommend it more on franchising and other things, but also looking a lot at the U.S. hegemony and how basically, yes, it's true, the U.S. basically outsourced all the manufacturing. And if we see the large trend, uh, it's most of the manufacturing went to Asia and Mexico and so on. But what the U.S. have is a lot of entry of dollars with the payments for intellectual property rights. So basically, it's true that the U.S. will need to buy a lot from uh, the rest of the world. But in terms of the concentrated power in the U.S., they still get from the rest of the world a larger flow of income in the form of intellectual property rights. What happens internally in the U.S. is that we see hubs that are extremely rich and that are concentrating not only part of the production, but also the ascetization of knowledge, like, of course, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Boston, and New York, and so on. And then most of the country, if you go to Detroit, can be confused by a Latin American city. So this uh, high inequality that led also to things like a decrease in the um, life expectancy and, and other social variables 
is in part the effect of these transformations that, global, that were driven by globalization. And one of the things that we do in one paper uh, with uh, Cédric and also with Tristan Aubrey, who teaches at EPOG, and also with Joel Rabinovich, who is an EPOG alumni, was to look at, in a way, the, what we describe as two moments in financialization that I call Mark I and Mark II, not because of a parallel with the Schumpeter Mark I and Mark II. Last year, when Epoch asked me this question, and I realized, like, okay, it generates confusion. I'm so sorry. But it's just to highlight two moments, and the current moment driven by intellectual monopolization and asset managers, asset managers who also have privileged knowledge because of the way they invest and because they are seated in so many boards, they have privileged knowledge on capitalism and they reinforce the healthiness of concentrated capitalism. What they care about is not one specific company and how that company goes, but mostly how concentrated capital goes. So this, the, the existence of asset managers reinforces intellectual monopolization and they themselves are intellectual monopolies. BlackRock has a platform that is called Aladdin and they harvest a lot of data and analyze also a lot of data, so just as a sideline. But basically what we say there is because these companies do not need to invest so much in tangible assets, because part of that was outsourced and they still capture part of that value. Because at the same time, they do invest a lot in, in intangible assets, but partly also they capture it either for free or is co-developed with others, but then turn into their own assets. They end up having a lot of liquidity. With this liquidity, they go to the financial market. So it's not that um, this simple story of in like tangible capital investment is like capex is going down because the, these companies are more financialized, but the financialization is, becomes more an outcome of this dynamic. They have all this money. They are already controlling larger and larger parts of the world, and they use part of this money also in the financial sector as financial actors, but they also in some cases, some of these companies pay a lot of dividends and do buybacks. Others don't do it, but still reward their shareholders with the increase of the price of their stocks. And yet others, what do, and, and many, as I showed you, invest in venture capital that has this double dimension. There is a PhD thesis that was done by a PhD student that uh, was working with me on um, the idea of venture capital as a power block and how it was at the intersection between financialization and intellectual monopolization with, uh, not, not exactly with the data that I showed, but just largely thinking of the concept of venture capital. So these are things that I can say with a caveat, which is that some of these intellectual monopolies are also very intensive, intangible assets, not only the big tech that are associated with the cloud, but also companies like Walmart and so on. And it's there where the concept of means of information and knowledge appropriation becomes so important. So in the end, it was not just a story about intangibles. It's also about tangibles, but about strategic tangibles, not every tangible. Then we run out of time <laughs> very fast. Um, knowledge commons as a solution. I, I think that there is no one single policy that will solve this. I think that there needs to be a lot of coordination, international coordination, a lot of activism, a lot of transformations that go beyond one single policy. Let's say knowledge commons, again, without education, without public free education systems and the chances for everyone that wants to study to study, it's very unlikely that these knowledge commons will be equally used by everyone. So, just to give you that, and that is only just to give you one example uh, in the sense of like any, it doesn't matter which policy we think of by itself, it's definitely not enough. How technolo technological cooperation among big tech? Yes, absolutely. They are among their favorite co-authors to give you one concrete uh, like empiric empirics on this. And they, but precisely because they operate in this um, process of splitting up the uh, innovation process in many pieces, they can cooperate for developing certain pieces and they work together to do so. And then still, even though they do that, they do not endanger their secret sources, if you want. And this is particularly the case of some big tech because Apple remains always very secretive and sealed. And for instance, Apple uh, did um, and an agreement with TSMC that probably never was out. I don't know, I, did, I never saw this before the person that told me this. Uh, uh, I mean, I never heard of it before someone that I interviewed told me about it. Apple hired TSMC to do some R&D for the virtual reality headsets. 
And why? Well, basically because he didn't want to hire anyone from the US because he didn't want, one, to share the intellectual property with those others, two, to be stolen, as at one point happened when it was manufacturing part of the semiconductors from Samsung, and then Samsung and start entered the smartphone business. And also because, and, and of course TSMC will never compete, the principle of TSMC is that they just, they are a foundry and they only manufacture the semiconductors. And also, at the same time, TSMC had the capabilities, had the people doing the R&D and wanted to do it because eventually that reinforces their business with Apple, which is the, its top one client. Uh, so yes, they do cooperate a lot, even like the Google with Amazon, Google with Microsoft and so on in specific things. And also largely, they are all connected. They are all connected. Google has people that sell the holistic products of Google targeted address to its strategic partners. In Europe, they have 80 strategic partners, includes mostly large multinational corporations, but also organizations like the NHS. So um, yes, they are super connected. And this is part of like the idea of the web of control. Stickiness is stickiness. I don't know because precisely that is secret. So I ask as much as I could, but the concrete mechanisms were things that they cannot tell me basically. Easy to answer. Role of the state. I will answer with another question. Which state? The US and the Chinese state, at the same time that they try to control them, they are favored by these companies. Their hegemony in the world expands. And if you look at what the US has done recently in relation to regulating AI, the executive order on AI is basically what US big tech companies wanted. And what Yellen said is like, it's two sentences, I will, because I don't have time to connect the slide because that was in one of my slides, I will read it anyway. She said, um, let us be clear, when it comes to AI, America, America is the US state. I say this because it's also a whole continent, but for some reason, yeah, well, it's a global leader. It is American companies, again, US companies, that lead the world in AI innovation. It is America that can catalyze global action and build global consensus in a way that no other country can. Not only recognizing that these that US companies are the ones that are controlling the technology, but also when one looks at the executive order on regulating AI, the only thing they regulate is the use, the adoption of AI. And this is something that even Satya Nadella, I will read you another thing that I will not connect now, and when he was asked about regulation, we do not have to wait for regulation to have a standards or adopt them as a standard. I call it the start of any self-regulation. Then on top of that, if we talk about regulation, maybe we can unpack it from the application domain. Because after all context in which something because after all context in which something is being applied in education, healthcare, retail, and we have the regulatory frameworks that already exist. So basically what these people were claiming, and I have other quotes, is and, and how they are, they are uh, controlling the narrative of how we think about AI, what AI is supposed to be, why we think that AI is a threat or not, why AI is replacing labor or not, and all the narratives about this. When it comes to regulations, the way they control it is by saying, let's regulate the application. Basically, it's, let's regulate some of our clients, but not regulate the production of AI. Because regulating the production of AI is what they are doing they are controlling the production of AI. Instead of that, they are diverting the conversation to regulate the uses of AI. They know they will be regulated. These companies, I mean, have the cleverest minds probably in the world. They know they will be regulated. So it's not a matter of regulation, yes or no. It's about what type of regulation will be put in place and how that regulation will further favor the intellectual monopolization, and this is what's happening. So when it comes to the role of the state, it's complicated. Because in talks with the US Federal Trade Commission, they do know that they are concentrating technologies, but still it's hard. So the state is not only about cores and peripheries, it's also that the state is not monolithic. Inside the state, there are different agencies. And although the US Federal Trade Commission may want to dismantle these intellectual monopolies, at the same time, other parts of the United States uh, government, including the US Department of Defense, for instance, are very happy that these companies exist and reinforce the US hegemony. So it's very complicated to think about the role of the state in abstract terms. Yes, of course, we need more planning and the states and in developing countries in, um, in, in, in also regional agreements, we can think of development of 
uh, infrastructure that it's uh, public infrastructure so that models and so on can be trained in public infrastructure, public clouds and so on, but the EU failed in the process. The EU tried to have its public Gaia-X project and ended up inviting big tech companies to sit on the table. So we are really, really in the middle of a turmoil and it's not easy to say what will happen. Difference between companies, I think we ran out of time, but I'm happy to discuss this anyway afterwards. And thanks a lot, I'm sorry that um, it, we ended like six, seven minutes after the time. You still have like eight minutes of break. Thank you.